I'll start with a case presentation and then um, give a brief overview of the uh, different types of renewable energy sources and then um, go over um, the intra-op uh, case video um, and then discuss some papers about um, different treat treatment options for um, sagittal green stenosis. Um, so our patient was a three-year-old boy, um, no significant past medical history. Uh, he presented to the emergency room after falling down stairs. Uh, who do we have? Brennan, um, what, would you, or what would be your next step? You're muted, Brandon. Okay, we can probably move on to Jorge, if you wanna take a shot. Sure. Um, in a three-year-old boy who just fell down the stairs, I would just uh, try to confirm he's reaching the milestones properly. Uh, sounds like he's walking already, so that's, that's good. Um, get a, you know, get a good uh, physical exam and see how he's moving his extremities um, and how he's doing overall. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, for any, any patient, be adult or pediatric, uh, anyone presenting with a trauma, you want to start with uh, make, doing your ABCs, making sure they're stable. And if they are, then you want to start doing your exam. Um, and like you mentioned, we want to make sure that he's awake, age appropriate, moving all extremities. Um, and our patient was, uh, so he was widely stable and he was moving uh, all extremities, falling commands. Um, what would you like to do next? Okay. On the assessment, how's, how's his head, how's, you know? He's stable, he's uh, he has a mild headache, otherwise he's drowsy, but not does not have any other pain anywhere or any other complaints. Okay. Um, well, the next thing I would like to do is um, Take a close look at his um, head, and uh, I probably we, we usually start with a with an ultrasound of head. Okay. Um, so for trauma patients, um, be it them adults or uh, pediatrics, uh, especially if they have a history of head trauma, you want to go ahead and um, you can do a head ultrasound. But in the ED, realistically, getting an ultrasound right there at that point in time. Uh, a lot of times it's not possible. Um, and nowadays we have, for pediatric patients, we have the low dose, um, rate, low radiation dose CAT scan. So we can go ahead and get a CAT scan. Um, so we went and got a CT of his head. All right, and just keep in mind that this patient's three, so you can't do an ultrasound. The fontanelle's closed. Yeah, fontanelle's closed. So you want to comment on it, Jorge? Yep, um, 3D reconstruction. Um, I see coronal sutures um, and on top of his head, I can see uh, that the sagittal suture has been fused already. Um, yep, so this is a very slow um, moving Jeff, I took a couple of screenshots. Um, so these are the two key images. Um, so as you picked up correctly, um, the sagittal suture seems like it's fused. Uh, what else do you notice on the other uh, upper right image? On the on the lower image. On the upper image. I see some um, bulging of the the shape of the head and mm -hmm. some increased growth. Uh, following the suture line. Yeah. yeah, so keeping in mind that it's a trauma patient, so um, my mouse does not seem to cover on this, but you can see, uh, so we're on the right side of his head, um, there's a fracture uh, which in the occipital region, uh, which goes superiorly towards the lambdoid suture and inferiorly towards the mastoid. Um, so this patient ended up having a fracture um, as a result of his fall. Sorry, my computer is My computer is frozen. I might have to restart. 
Do you, do you want me to show your slides, Halima, since you shared them with me this morning? Yes. Okay. Um, give me a second. I'll bring them up. Mm -hmm. All right, just tell me when you want to advance. Um, so in the interest of time, um, so we got a CAT scan. The CAT scan showed uh, a right-sided fracture as well as um, a disappearance, which is called copper beating uh, on this CAT scan, um, as well as uh, sagittal, um, uh, sagittal cranial stenosis. Uh, so what, uh, Abby or Bandon, do you want to um, take a shot at what, what that um, is representative of? I'll go um, so representative of CSF uh, uh, palpations, generally from like a full uh, uh, small wall space, um, enclosing, encasing the brain. So pulsation uh, uh, causes indentation scaffolds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this scaffolding on the inside of the, uh, on the inner table of the bone is due to increased uh, intracranial pressure. Uh, which could, uh, which is reflective that it could be because of this um, synestosis. Go to the next slide. Uh, so cranial synestosis is premature closure of one or more of the cranial sutures. Um, it is present in uh, one in 2100 to one in 2500 uh, birds. Um, and this picture depicts um, all of the um, major sutures. And uh, the, the sutures that are most commonly involved in cranial synestosis are the sagittal sutures followed by coronal, coronal and metopic. Um, there are multiple factors um, that lead to the etiology of cranial synestosis, including um, environmental as well as genetic. Um, and uh, it's in terms of genetic factors, usually autosomal dominant um, and usually due to a mutation in the uh, fibro fibroblast growth factor uh, genes two and three. So um, the reason why um, cranial synostosis leads to um, deformity in the shape of the skull um, is explained by Virchow's law, which basically uh, states that whenever a suture closes early, the skull cannot go perpendicular to it. So uh, it starts growing uh, parallel to it instead. Um, as you can see in all these pictures, um, the red arrow points towards the suture that's fused abnormally. Um, and then the, um, the green arrows show the compensatory um, growth in the um, other sutures, uh, leading to all of these um, cranial vault abnormalities. Um, so I'll quickly just um, go through the different types of cranial stenosis doses. Um, but uh, before doing that, I want to touch upon uh, positional plagiocephaly, uh, which is uh, one of the most common cranial deformity um, that is, that is brought to um, our attention and is a lot of times confused with uh, cranial synostosis. Um, so positional plagiocephaly um, occurs usually because of uh, positioning, um, especially um, now with the, um, in the era of, um, with the increase of SIDS, um, babies lying, uh, not having tummy time and lying on their back, uh, there has been an increased incidence. Um, and patients with uh, positional plagiocephaly uh, basically have their um, ipsilateral ear and forehead um, displaced anteriorly, um, and there's contralateral occipital bossing. So they have a parallelogram shaped head. Um, and some conditions uh, which um, predispose to such, uh, to Positional pages that they are critical is um, prematurity and gross motor delay. Uh, so, sagittal stenosis is the most common uh, type of cranial stenosis. It's also known as uh, scaphalocephaly as well, uh, and also dolicocephaly. Um, and as depicted in this picture, uh, the most classic findings is uh, the the, uh, the uh, children have a boat shaped head. Um, they have frontal bossing uh, as well as occipital bossing, which is known as uh, bullet. 
Um, sometimes the ridging of the sagittal suture may be palpable. Um, and because they cannot grow, um, because the uh, sagittal suture is fused, they, their head does not grow in width. So it elongates anterior posteriorly. And that's why they typically have increased head circumference, um, usually around the 98th percentile. Um, coronal synostosis is not as common, but could be either unilateral or um, bilateral. Um, and the most classic um, finding in that is the um, Harlequin sign, which can be seen on um, uh, radiographs such as x-rays. Um, bilateral coronal synostosis, uh, synostosis um, presents with brachycephaly in which the head is shorter and wider. Um, and this is associated with hypertelorism, so the eyes are spaced apart. Uh, more than normal, um, and can also have the Harlequin mal malformation on the uh, orbital radiographs. Uh, Metopic synostosis uh, usually leads to the classic um, triangular uh, appearance of the head. Um, and as opposed to coronal synostosis, this is associated with the eyes being closer together than normal. So the patients have uh, hypotelorism. And then um, lastly, lambdoid synostosis um, is a posterior plagiocephaly um, in which um, there is frontal and occipital bossing, but it's contralateral to the affected side. Um, so the picture on, um, on the right lower corner uh, depicts the differences between um, positional plagiocephaly and lambdoid synostosis. Um, and the, the most uh, classic sign is that uh, the head is trapezoid shaped as opposed to parallelogram shaped in the uh, positional plagiocephaly. And the ipsilateral ear and mastoid are displaced downward in lambdoid synostosis. Um, uh, so if a patient is present, uh, when a patient presents with, uh, to us with cranial synostosis, um, there are certain factors in the history that we want to um, be mindful of, um, including family history of uh, unusual head shapes, um, prenatal exposure to um, teratogens, um, any, any evidence of intrauterine uh, constraint, including um, multi multiple pregnancy. Um, and then we always want to be mindful of taking a complete developmental history and um, uh, asking the parents about uh, whether the patient has reached their milestones or not, because sometimes um, uh, craniocephaly, uh, craniosynostosis could be associated with developmental delays. So on physical exam, uh, you want, like with any other patient, you want to do a head to toe exam. Um, you start with the uh, looking at the skull shape in all directions. Um, you check for dysmorphic facial features, um, check the head circumference. Um, and then something that is relevant to specifically cranial synostosis is cephalic index, which is basically the ratio of the uh, maximum breadth to the maximum length. Um, and it's normally 0.76 to 0.83 in boys and 0.84 in girls. Um, it is hard to do it in office or, or in the ED because it usually requires having calipers or some sort of measuring device in you. Um, uh, we can also look for sutural ridging, which might be present in some sorts of some kinds, especially uh, sagittal synostosis, as well as prominent blood vessels on the scalp. Um, and then you always uh, want to check the shape, size, and tension of the fontanelles to see if there's any, uh, and to see if there's any other physical features, because um, syndromic cranial synostosis might have um, other uh, physical features, for example. Um, thumb deviation in the Pfeiffer syndrome and syndactyly and Apert syndrome. Uh, you also want to, um, if there is any concern for increased intracranial pressure, you can get an opth ophthalmologic exam for papilledema. And then you want to assess um, functional consequences, which are not so common in single suture cranial synostosis, but um, more so in um, syndromic cranial synostosis. So these babies can have airway obstruction. Um, having issues with their eye closures so need eye protection as well as uh, feeding difficulties. In terms of imaging, um, the we always start from um, least invasive to most invasive. And um, like we mentioned earlier, we can get an ultrasound in babies who uh, have open fontanelles. Um, we, we, in this era, uh, we usually end up getting a CAT scan given that we have the low dose, uh, low radiation dose for children. Um, and it shows the classic um, findings of uh, the different types of cranial synostosis. Um, we can also get MRIs, um, and there's a specific um, gradient Nisman echo sequence that um, helps us uh, distinguish the signal void of cranial bones from the sutures. So the sutures uh, are hyper intense. 
um, on the on, um, Gray's imaging. And then like we discussed for our patient, um, there might be signs of increased ICP on CAT scan, including uh, copper beating appearance of the skull, um, as well as um, secondary carry malformation. Uh, so, uh, cranial stenosis is important uh, in that it not just causes uh, craniofacial abnormalities and cosmetic issues, but also has um, uh, several um, complications, including increased ICP. Um, and as an incidence of as much as 15% has been seen in different types of um, cranial stenosis, again, more so in syndromic uh, cranial stenosis, uh, not so much in single suture. Um, the patients can also present with developmental delay, and that could also be as high as 37% um, reported in some studies. Um, they can have sensory, respiratory, and neurological dysfunction, and eye abnormalities, as well as um, psychological disturbances. Uh, so, like I mentioned, they, this disease or syndrome can have a, a significant neuropsychological uh, impact on patient. Um, and multiple studies have been performed to look at this. And a recent longitudinal study um, showed that um, children with uncomplicated cranial stenosis uh, exhibit mild cognitive and academic deficits. Um, and this, these deficits were more common um, in metopic or um, coronal or lambdoid stenosis, uh, not so much in sagittal stenosis, which is the most common kind. Um, and then the highest variations were found in IQ and computer skills. Um, speech and reading were not significantly affected. So um, going back to our case, um, the, our patient has uh, sagittal um, cranial stenosis, um, and he's three. So um, the treatment of cranial stenosis depends uh, on multiple factors. Uh, one of the most important ones is uh, the patient's age. Um, so briefly um, touch upon the different treatment options. So this schematic, um, essentially summarizes the different um, treatment options available for sagittal uh, cranial stenosis. Um, so the, the first one um, depicts um, endoscopic suturectomy, uh, which requires just uh, two uh, small incisions and then inserting an endoscope and performing um, the, um, a strip craniectomy. Um, the next panel um, shows um, a strip craniectomy uh, with a uh, spring assist device, um, which can be done either endoscopically or open. Um, and it is done with the thought, uh, so the, the limitation with um, just doing a strip craniectomy is that in children who are young, um, younger than six months of age, especially, um, they, they can, um, they have uh, accelerated uh, bone growth. So the sutures, despite having the, um, a strip craniectomy, the sutures can fuse again and they might need a reoperation. Uh, re um, so the spring device um, helps in um, distracting the um, suture and keeping it open. Um, the panel C uh, depicts an uh, open, um, uh, open strip craniectomy um, with um, barrel staves um, uh, craniectomies um, to um, reformat the cranial vault. Um, Panel D is a more recent um, method of dealing with sagittal uh, cranial stenosis in which you do a small strip craniectomy and then you put in distractors, uh, which can be modified. Um, and then um, they stay in for a few months uh, after which the patient has to go for a re-op um, uh, to take them out. Um, panel E is the uh, open cranial wall reconstruction procedure, uh, which is, um, some, uh, also known as uh, the pie procedure. Um, and then uh, panel F depicts, depicts the, the changes in the um, cranial walls before and after um, the use of helmet. Um, so I'll, in the next few slides, I'll quickly touch over all of those. Um, uh, so the first uh, and the most commonly uh, performed procedure for uh, sagittal crani uh, cranial stenosis in children who are less than six months uh, is endoscopic strip craniectomy. Um, it basically um, entails um, doing a strip craniectomy with the with 
uh, through two small incisions um, and with the, with the aid of an endoscope. Um, the patient is position prone um, and uh, in a door or horseshoe head headdress. Um, it has several advantages, including um, shorter duration of surgery, um, less blood loss, as well as uh, shorter um, length of stay in the hospital. Um, the limitations of uh, this approach are that it can only be performed in um, children who are three to six months of age, um, because after that the bone um, is thick and cannot is not amenable um, to just endoscopic um, treatment. Um, and the patient, uh, in most uh, most people, advocate the use of a helmet um, for three to six months after um, endoscopic strip craniectomy, uh, which is cumbersome for the patient and the parents. Um, so that's one of the limitations of this approach. Um, so the next approach is um, strip craniectomy and spring placement, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, could either be done um, op uh, through an open approach, which is shown in the upper panel, uh, or an endoscopic approach uh, with the use of a, a sonopet ultrasonic knife. Um, and uh, again, similar to the endoscopic um, strip craniectomy, it, it, the advantages of this approach are it's a shorter length of stay and uh, lesser blood loss. Uh, but often this, uh, this approach almost always requires a second stage procedure to remove this, uh, the spring, um, and uh, it might still require the use of a helmet. So the, um, for children, mostly all ages, but uh, more than six months of age, uh, the most common procedure used is cranial wall reconstruction. Um, and it, it has several advantages, including it obviates the need for a helmet, it's a definitive procedure, so it does not require a second stage procedure. Um, however, given that it's more invasive, it has a higher, uh, longer intraoperative uh, anesthesia time, as well as a uh, higher chance of blood loss, as well as a longer length of stay. Um, and as um, shown in these pictures, um, it is also done uh, in a prone position with the patient in the uh, dural horseshoe headrest. Um, there's different um, versions of the type of reconstructions um, that can be performed, um, including the pipe procedure, the modified pipe procedure, um, barrel safe screen um, it the, the choice of which depends on um, the surgeon. So, um, so going back to our patient, uh, given that he was three years of age, um, he was not amenable um, to endoscopic uh, to an endoscopic procedure, um, and he had um, the um, signs of increased ICP. So we went ahead and did um, cranial wall uh, reconstruction for him. Um, so this is a, uh, the intra uh, video. Um, so we did a, a bicoronal incision um, and took the um, skin flap down. Um, and then we did the um, burr holes on either side of the um, sagittal suture. Um, and then uh, stripped the dura off of our burr holes, making sure um, it was safe to go ahead and do our um, strip craniectomy, um, after which we will remove the craniectomy. and then get hemostasis. Um, the next step is getting um, the dura um, off of all aspects uh, of the inner cranial wall. Um, then we marked out our uh, parietal craniectomies um, and then um, she, uh, took off our periosteum as well as um, the muscle, which is uh, in the periosteal flap. Um, and then we're here we are performing the, um, the parietal craniectomy. And you can see this, the squamosal suture um, down there. So once we perform the parietal craniectomy, we we can go ahead and do our wedge craniectomy. And then we repeat the same, um, same thing on the other side. So the uh, contralateral parietal craniectomy. Just add that the wedge craniectomy is to free up the squamosal suture and help you improve the AP diameter of the skull. 
And then we're taking the wedge off of the either side of the strip craniectomy and then use the wires to reduce the AP diameter um, to hold the, uh, this in place. And then this was uh, replaced by um, the um, silastic plates, which are uh, absorbable. After which we remove the wires. You can see this is called a pie procedure because the bone strips in the middle look like an upside down letter, Greek letter pie. And the, these are the uh, the bone strips that we get. And then the the strip craniectomy, uh, we basically um, go through the uh, we split it so that we can have bone graft um, for um, for craniopathy. And this is using the tessier bone benders just to refashion the um, parietal bone plate. So then we suture the parietal bone plates back and then um, suture the periosteum over it. And this is how it looks um, finally at the end of the procedure. Um, and then in the middle where the, the strip craniectomy was, we um, um, fill the space with our bone graft. And this is our post-op CAT scan, which shows um, the reconstruction. And you can see how the AP diameter is now um, reduced. And there we left drains in place. So um, cranial wall reconstruction as a procedure is a um, pretty morbid, significant procedure, which has um, a possible multiple complications, including intraoperative bleeding, um, postoperative hematoma, um, intra and postoperative hyperthermia due to the length of the procedure, um, wound infection, um, dural tears, CSF leak, as well as um, meningitis. So there have been, um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's multiple treatment options for sagittal craniosynostosis and um, Till date, there's no consensus about what is the ideal procedure. Um, there have been multiple studies which discuss um, the endoscopic versus open treatment and within open treatments, the different types of treatment. Um, most of these studies um, show um, superiority of the endoscopic procedure in terms of the um, duration of the procedure, the hospital length of stay, um, intraoperative blood loss. Um, however, um, you have to keep in mind that the endoscopic procedure is only uh, applicable to uh, patients who are less than six months of age. So a lot of these studies um, do not account for that. Um, so, um, uh, as shown in this slide uh, and, and this one, um, the clinical outcomes as well as um, uh, the length of stay and um, the clinical outcomes as well as the um, aesthetic outcomes are similar in both approaches. Um, and this has been shown by multiple uh, studies. The only uh, this is decision-making factor is the patient's age as well as um, uh, discussion with the parents about the uh, possibility of requiring a blood transfusion, um, as well as um, discussing with them the uh, length of anesthesia time. Um, I included this study because um, this uh, sort of demonstrates how there is no consensus uh, in, in the treatment options for different types of um, non-syndromic sexual craniosynostosis. synthesis. So this was a survey-based study where um, they sent, um, my, uh, it was, um, it included uh, pediatric neurosurgeons as well as um, craniofacial surgeons and plastic surgeons. Um, and um, they, it was survey um, assessing um, the indications for surgery and what were their preferred procedures. Um, and it showed that the most common indication for um, uh, performing surgery was skull deformity followed by, um, in pre, uh, followed by a risk for developmental delay um, or mental disability, um, and then uh, increased intracranial pressure. Um, interestingly, um, for uh, children who are less than four months of age, neurosurgeons preferred open approaches and um, craniofacial surgeons preferred endoscopic approaches. Um, and then when performing an open intervention, um, neurosurgeons usually preferred the pie or the reverse pie procedure, uh, whereas the craniofacial surgeons uh, preferred um, total cranial wall remodeling. Um, so this just basically is to um, drive home the point that there is there are multiple treatment options and it's a very patient um, specific approach um, and, and 
also uh, very surgeon specific in terms of the choice of procedure. Um, next slide. So in conclusion, um, treatment of cranial stenosis requires a multidisciplinary approach, um, as you can see at our institution as well. Uh, it not only includes neurosurgeon and plastic surgery team, but also um, requires um, the PEATS team, uh, as well as if the patient needs a helmet, uh, putting them in touch with um, uh, the team that takes care of um, long-term follow-up for that. Um, there are a wide variety of treatment options for man management of sagittal stenosis, um, but there's conflicting evidence regarding the treatment of choice. Um, in children who are uh, younger than three to six months of age, endoscopic approach is favored. Um, and for older children, um, cranial wall reconstruction is favored. Um, and then long-term clinical outcomes um, retain, uh, remain to be determined. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Morgenstern, for giving the opportunity to uh, be a part of this case. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Helene. Well, I just I want to add just a couple quick comments. But um, so in the imaging workup, um, you talked about ultrasound, CT, and MRI. A fair number of these kids can be diagnosed with no imaging, but your um, sort of order of operations is a good one. I think starting with non-radiating imaging, like a suture ultrasound, actually specifically, can often give you a diagnosis if you're unsure. Um, though the 3D CT can be useful for surgical planning for a vault. Um, the indications for treating this child were really about ICP. So in a typical three-year-old with sagittal synostosis, if the deformity, the cosmetic deformity is not dramatic, I, I would probably follow them um, with serial ophthalmologic exams and make sure they're not developing papilledema. Because once they get past age three or four, then the, the potential benefit of the operation can be outweighed by just the, the sheer size of the operation. This is much more straightforward in a younger baby. Um, and lastly, in terms of endoscopic indications, I, I think most of the field at this point would agree that the outcomes, especially for sagittal synostosis, although for coronal and metopic, there's still some debate about whether the cosmetic outcomes are equivalent between the two. But if you, it, it's really just about diagnosed age. So if they're under three months, they're all candidates for an endoscopic procedure. And I would push that as the standard of care, given the safety of the operation. Um, and as they get older, they really sort of move into the, the open reconstruction category with the sagittal kids potentially tolerating, the endos uh, tolerating and having good outcomes with the endoscopic approach up to a greater age than the other ones because of the less severe facial deformities. But all of those other things that you mentioned like springs and distractors, those, those are all, all things that different centers work with. And I think the moral of the story is that almost everything that you do uh, will work as long as you do it well. Um, so you find the technique that you're comfortable with and, um, and you apply it to your patients. Sadie, do you have any other, other comments before we go to more questions? Yes, can you hear me? How much time do we have, sir? Uh, we have another 10 minutes. So Hallie T, I would say uh, one uh, excellent job, by the way. That's a brilliant overview in a very short period of time. Just some modifications that are slight. When you're looking, these things about parallelogram and trapezoid, which is probably the most common thing any neurosurgeon is going to see, is looking at positional molding to distinguish it from synostosis. You're looking from the top. And the parallelogram shape is the thing that you just focus on to reassure parents they don't need to do anything and that this is not a sinister condition. It's actually a modern baby phenomenon, 20% of all kids. And I don't typically advocate they put them in helmets for this condition. The ears are also important to pay attention to because the ear on the side of the flattening is pushed forward and the ear on the side, contralateral side is back. Whereas in synostosis, in lambdoid, the ear is kind of diverted down. It's a very weird shape to the ear. And that's the thing to pay attention to. In sagittal synostosis, I am not an advocate for imaging. Just like uh, JB doesn't drill down the condyle anymore for far lateral, I almost never get imaging on these kids. And the reason is because in sagittal synostosis, for me, the most striking feature when you look from the top is a narrowed 
by parietal diameter because every other human without sagittal synostosis has a narrower bifrontal than biparietal. And when the biparietal is narrow, it's very noticeable. So if you look from the top and the biparietal diameter is narrow, sagittal synostosis. The other comment is about this copper beaten skull that I know everybody is very fascinated by. And you know that it is a natural phenomenon. It's not necessarily associated with raised intracranial pressure. It occurs during cranial development and it's just an indentation of the gyral and sulcal pattern on the inside of the skull. So it is not pathognomonic for raised intracranial pressure. And I agree with Peter that if you're looking at these kids at age three, there better be a compelling reason to operate on them. And I didn't quite understand, did this guy have raised intracranial pressure? And by what index did you measure that? So he, he, had, he had two things. He, it, part of it was the degree of copper beating, which I felt was more than, more than I would typically see at age three. But the second was that he had a developmental delay. He did. Um, and so that, that those are the two indications that I discussed with the parents. And also the mom felt that he looked dramatically different from the rest of his family. To me, that's the most important indication for surgery. When there is a cosmetic problem at an early age, that is going to give rise to a series of deviations from norm in terms of development that culminates in that kid not having the same developmental opportunities that other kids will have just based on appearance alone. I just have never really seen, and maybe it's because I haven't seen enough, raised intracranial pressure with synostosis. So I, I think that the best indication is the degree of cranial deformity to drive you. In coronal synostosis, Hallie T, the harlequin eye is not something you necessarily need to see radiographically. You can see it when you just look directly at the baby because their eye looks like they're giving you a note of surprise. They're kind of looking at you and one of the eye, eyes is raised. The orbits are not symmetric, which goes to this point about diagnosis and that is, and I think JB and Raj and some of the older guys in the group will agree that in the politically incorrect days of yore, our diagnostic acumen with synostosis was, is this a funny looking kid? FLK, right? We didn't pull out the calipers. Most of the time we would do a CT, but that to me is the best measure of whether or not a child has a cranial problem. Is there something about their feature that is not quite right? And if you look at the orbits of the vast majority of humans, they're symmetrical. And in coronal synostosis, the harlequin eye is very visible in these children. In metopic synostosis, trigonocephaly for sure, but don't mistake it for sagittal, sorry, for metopic ridging, which is a very common condition. The big difference is you get scalloping over the orbits. You get this indentation right over the orbits in those metopic cases. Finally, I don't agree that you require a helmet in the strip craniectomies that are done minimally invasively. I've had parents that changed my mind on that who refused to put their kids in a helmet and the cosmetic outcomes were just as good with than they were without it. So uh, I've, I've learned that the hard way with the parents, but otherwise, fantastic job, great presentation. Thank you. Can we go to a few questions? I saw a couple of hands up. Uh, Brandon? Yeah, hi, hi, Helena. I had a question about this case. Um, in, in the patient who presented as a trauma and had a, had a skull fracture, were there any uh, specific considerations or modifications that you had to make to the, to the surgical planning for, uh, for the case? So the non-displaced 
um, skull fracture, um, we did not, so did not require any surgical intervention. Um, and then uh, the patient was, so during this hospitalization, the patient um, stayed in the hospital for a few days because he had impact seizures. And then uh, of course it was complicated by uh, optimizing his AEDs, but then he was discharged and we brought him back uh, later uh, in a few months um, to do the surgery. Fracture had already healed, Brandon, by the time we got there. Yep. Uh, Alex's hand is up. Thanks, nice job, Halima. I um, just had a quick question about the small subset. So the 15% of documented patients that may have intracranial, underlying intracranial hypertension, in terms of the workup, would you work them up the same way you would for any other patient with intracranial hypertension? Like, would you get optic nerve sheet diameters or have them see ophthalmology, or would you potentially even do a lumbar puncture again, opening pressure? Can you talk a little bit about the management of intracranial hypertension in, these, in this subset of patients? Um, as Dr. Badan mentioned, so for single suture craniosynostosis, um, a lot of most patients do not have uh, increased intracranial pressure. Uh, it's more commonly associated with syndromic craniosynostosis. Um, and but my understanding, so I did not come across any um, data about doing lumbar punctures on these patients. Um, they do get ophthalmology, like, uh, ophthalmology uh, evaluation to check for papilledema. My, my, my sort of serial management of an untreated um, craniosynostosis patient is neurodevelopmental follow-up. So staying in touch with their pediatrician and, and seeing them every one to two years, as well as uh, annual ophthalmologic exams, just to make sure they don't develop papilledema. Thanks. Kurt? Yeah, thanks. First of all, Halima, great job with that, especially with the video. You obviously put a lot of effort into that, so um, it was very well done, so kudos on that. And my question is, what you mentioned a study talking about um, why in kids with sagittal synostosis, the deficits, the neurodevelopmental delays are less common. Any hypothesis as to why that is? So my uh, understanding of that was that um, Lambdoid and coronal synostosis are more commonly associated with syndromic um, synostosis, and those uh, those children are um, have a higher um, incidence of having developmental delays. Um, uh, if you, I don't know, Dr. Morganson, do you have any info? Well, that that study actually disagrees with um, some other studies that have shown that sagittal synostosis has a higher rate of intracranial pressure issues than the other ones if untreated. Um, I mean, the rate is small. We're talking single digit percentages. So I think the, to power a study to detect all of these differences, you probably have to have a very large observational cohort, um, which we just don't have in this group. I think overall, that to me, that the indications for surgery when you diagnose craniosynostosis and you have this discussion with families initially are primarily cosmetic, which affects um, psychosocial development and neurodevelopment followed by the much lower risk, which you should not overemphasize to the family, but the much lower risk of neurodevelopmental delays and ICP issues, the percentages are small. It's uncertain which patients will develop them. So I do think it's an indication for surgery, but it's a much lesser indication than just the cosmetic and the impact of cosmetic on psychosocial development. All right, I think we should... Uh, 